Hi, I'm Donna Rosenberg from Jamison Legal and I'm Director and Head of In-House for UK and Europe. I'm joined today by Nick Pester, Group General Counsel at Zego, to talk on the topic of the rise of the modern GC. This is a series of virtual interviews discussing a variety of subjects such as in-house careers, technology and changes in the legal industry, aimed at providing content and information through interview interviewing a variety of senior lawyers who have achieved management, strategic and or executive level positions. Nick is Group General Counsel at Zego. Zego offer insurance that makes sense for vehicles for work for less. Zego started in 2016 and now offer vehicle protection to over 200,000 businesses and sole traders. Nick started out in a traditional city insurance practice before moving to a niche entrepreneurial firm to set up a new insurance practice specialising in InsureTech. After two years there, he made the move in-house to Zego and now leads the legal and regulatory function with ultimate oversight of Zego's legal activities across all territories. Thanks for joining us today, Nick. How are you? Thank you. I'm very well. How are you? Yeah, very well. Thank you. Can you Good. tell us a little bit more about yourself? About myself? Um, <laughs> I guess like I've always kind of had a an interest in um, kind of pushing the boundaries and, and kind of innovation and, and, you know, the more creative kind of aspects of law rather than the kind of, you know, the, the black and white kind of view. Um, and that's kind of developed over time and kind of driven, obviously, my interest uh, in InsureTech, particularly as kind of where I think the insurance market is going next. But also has kind of piqued my interest in the you know the wider legal market and um, and actually how that needs to change to adapt to um, to current times. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I'm kind of hungry for knowledge, hungry for change, hungry for improvement. Um, and uh, hence, you know, obviously um, one of the reasons why I'm now at Zigo. Fantastic. And did that sort of, uh, when we look at the appeal of the topic of the rise of the modern GC in general, what was it that, uh, you know, you were interested in and what sort of um, uh, got you to a point where you're doing the virtual interview today? I think, um, you know, the legal market now is kind of in many ways unrecognizable from where it was when I was first applying for training contracts. And um, it's, you know, even more competitive than it was. Um, so many kind of new options and routes for for uh, for people coming into the profession, mm. and I guess from somebody who's kind of gone from you know literally one end of the spectrum of a very traditional um, legal practice to a very high paced kind of uh, tech startup in house, I've kind of seen it all and everything in between, and um, I just was really keen to kind of you know help other people who are in the same situation thinking about what route they want to take maybe those people who are actually considering making the move in house themselves um so i just you know always believe in kind of paying it forward so i was hoping to impart a few <clears throat> a few tips that might help others that were in my situation um you know 15 years ago fantastic and just talking about uh changes in the legal profession in general um, how do you see the legal professional changing and what impact may these changes have for lawyers in the future? I think the legal industry is in a, in a real state of flux at the moment. I think that's kind of been contributed to by sort of various different things. You've obviously got technological advancement and the impact that that has on, on law firms and the way they do business. You've got structural changes. You know, obviously the, the introduction of multidisciplinary practices was not that long ago. And I think that we're starting to now see that kind of real development in that area it was kind of slightly slow to start with and you kind of saw you know things like the big four accounting firms were setting up their own legal arms but other than that mm -hmm. it was relatively kind of slow uptake I think that's now slowly starting to come to fruition um, and I think that the the economic pressures as well obviously not not just in light of COVID um, have really kind of started to to take their toll in, in some respects on the on the legal sector and I feel that there are kind of two parts of the market, I would say, which which at the moment have kind of been relatively untouched by things, which I would call the kind of niche specialist boutique end at one on one side, and then the top end kind of magic circle on the other side, who still obviously have the very big global conglomerate clients. But you kind of got this massive swathe in the middle of mid market firms who I think have really been struggling on how to differentiate. You've seen a lot of M&A activity in that space. I think we'll continue to see that. I think 
there will be some firms, unfortunately, that 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 don't make it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that the the competition now is 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 you know fiercer than ever ever was before. And I think you know then looking at the individual side of things, the lawyers. I think like you know I remember when I was a trainee hearing the whole T shaped lawyer kind of concept and um, you know being encouraged to develop your commercial skills. I feel now that that's just kind of grown further to beyond the T-shaped concept where actually you need to have kind of te- technological experience or technology experience. You need to have wider commercial skills. You need to have really good people, yeah. um, people management skills. I just feel that it's it's really kind of become such a competitive environment now. Um, and I think, you know, with all of those different pressures, it's just going to continue, you know, becoming, uh, you know, going that going that direction. Yeah, that's really interesting. And how do you perceive uh, law firms may need to adapt in the future with respect to their traditional practices and structures? I think most of all is significantly more innovation. Um, you know, I mean, I, I obviously still know lots of people who, who work in private practice uh, from, from previous roles and people who have applied for roles at new businesses or, or at, sorry, at law firms who still, you know, very traditional, the way the, the service offering works, the way the fee structures work, the way they present themselves to the market, their image, um, very, very traditional. And I think that there needs to be innovation, not only in terms of obviously the use of technology is one thing that I've mentioned. And I mean that both from a matter management point of view, but also client engagement, you know, what do clients really want? Much more use of online portals, for example. I think that's kind of just in a real growth of that within the private um, uh, practice sphere recently. But also um, in terms of their offerings, like I say, I just think I, I, I strongly feel that, that the hourly rate model will, will, will die out within the next five years or so, because I just think it's not really cost effective for the client. It doesn't necessarily drive the best efficiencies. Litigation is obviously an area where we will take a little bit longer to move away from that. But we've already seen you know, the judiciary start to move towards fixed fees within the context of litigation. I don't see that that direction of travel changing. Um, but I think it will, put a re- it will put a lot of pressure on the traditional kind of equity structure, pyramid structure that you see at, tr- at private practice law firms, because you know, those those models have always kind of operated slightly at the, at, you know, to the benefit of, of a few at the expense of many and, and have driven that need for hourly rates. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that it's it's going to be a it's going to be a real kind of top top bottom up rather review of, of legal firm structures over the next um, over the next sort of few years. And how does that uh, sort of now bleed into what is happening in house regarding appointing or working with external legal counsel? Well, most of all, I think um, value added services become so much more are so much more relevant now. I mean, I, I remember being you know, part tender processes in private practice. Um, and I don't think any firm could tell you with a straight face that they were always expecting, you know, 100% of those services to actually be taken up by the client. And they were kind of put in there, obviously, partly, I mean, obviously, if it was ever called on, you would provide it. But the reality is, very rarely, actually, you would get the client coming back and, you know, making sure that they were implemented. I think that's changed now. I think certainly from our point of view, value-added services are really important to us. And if somebody offers value-added services, then we expect them to be kind of sincere about it. Um, And I think in-house are just looking increasingly for longer-term relationships and partnerships. There is nothing more frustrating for me as an in-house lawyer than somebody who you you, you speak to for the first time, you give them an opportunity to pitch for a piece of work, and it's a very kind of, you know, this is our typical hourly rate, this is our typical charge, very short term kind of what's the cost benefit to the business rather than, you know, looking down the line and thinking, well, actually, what is this relationship potentially worth to us over the next mm-hmm. one, two, three years? And I think that um, in-house demand that. And I think that law firms are slowly starting to catch up with that. And also I've seen much more engagement, actually, from our legal partners around what can we do better? How can we provide you know, more value add for you, um, which is obviously a great thing. I think also the kind of subscription model system, standing retainer, helpline, legal helpline, that type of thing, mm-hmm. I think is much more common. Um, you know, we have standing retainers in place with a couple of firms and it's literally a kind of ad hoc. You know, you need to pick up the phone and speak to somebody. You know, you just you put it on the same kind of general advice retainer. Um, you almost in a way kind of ends up acting like an outsourced legal function, particularly when you're in the earlier stages of the business. 
Um, so I think just going back to my point really about more more innovation around service offerings, not just this is our hourly rate, these are what this is what we do, these are our lawyers telling a story which kind of aligns with what you're trying to achieve as a business and that's relevant to to what you're what you're doing um, is still a, I think an art that many lawyers you know struggle with um, and need to get better at. Thank you. Uh, Nick, if we look at maybe Zigo and um, the pandemic and how you adapted to flexible working uh, when all of this happened, um, how how do you look in terms of um, remote working and flexibility? What what impact has that had since the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I mean, in some ways for us, it was kind of a return to normality, I guess, because we we uh, obviously our customer base is a lot, of, you know, largely gig economy workers and people who work really flexibly. So it would be slightly, I think it'd be slightly hypocritical of us if we um, if we kind of then had a had any objection to remote working. I think finally there's been an appreciation of the fact that um, you know you can do the same job sitting in your home um, with the right setup, obviously, um, and actually in in many ways you can be more effective and more productive at your job. Uh, you know you don't you you lose the travel time kind of deficit that you would usually have. You move going into the office. Um, it's a much more relaxed approach. There, you can take proper breaks. You know, you can actually go and sit in your garden, wherever else you want to do, and actually take a proper break from things for 10, 15 minutes if you need to. Much better work-life balance. You know, I mean, I now see my kids every day. We have lunch most days together when they're not at school. I'm glad they've gone back to school, by the way. <laughs> um, but at dinner together as a family, and uh, it, you know, much more. I think a much sort of more reasonable balance between the two things and I think I think you know even private practices are to my understanding starting to get their head around this more and and you know I think the days of expecting lawyers to be at their desk 9 to 9 9 a.m to 6 p.m five days a week um and kind of clock watching in that in that way I think there may be some exceptions but I think largely that they will just disappear because like I say for my part it's been very productive I think where it's created some problems is obviously around the um, the, um, the junior staff members um, because particularly within private practice you know being around senior colleagues is an extremely important part of your training um, and my wife still works in private practice and I know that that's one of the main challenges that they've had is making sure that junior lawyers are still getting the training um, and development needs that they that they deserve, right? That they expect. Um, but there are ways to address that. You know, we're looking at, you know, making sure we have one day a week in as a team as a team day. Um, looking more at the use of online training and development platforms, giving kind of lawyers credits to kind of use for that type of training and development um, program. So there are ways around it. And I think that everything is a healthy balance. You know, as long as we, um, I think most importantly allow the individual to decide um, uh, subject to obviously making sure the wider team is not detrimented by it um, letting the individual kind of make their own decisions um, I feel that you know some some private practice um, environments the juniors are not always treated as kind of adults and you know we, we shouldn't forget that these are very highly qualified very educated people who are quite capable of making these decisions for themselves uh, and I think that that's kind of for, that this whole experience has kind of forced that issue probably a bit more um, but overall I think it's been I think it's kind of made us all appreciate priorities in life as well mm, definitely <laughs> definitely what would what would be uh, the potential advice that you would give uh, a younger lawyer who was looking to or, or already knew that an in-house career was something that they wanted to do in respect to training within private practice and staying as a qualified solicitor in private practice for a length of time versus mm -hmm. moving into an in-house environment and the quality of training that, that one might get if they were to do that um, earlier on in their career? I think it's a really good question. I think. I mean, first of all, everybody is different. I mean, I, I had always harboured aspirations of going in-house throughout my career. Um, obviously, my decision to go in-house was slightly later than some people would take it. Uh, that was a personal choice. Um, but there are some people who are very kind of set on being in-house from the very beginning. I think 
as always, there's a healthy middle ground. But what I would say is, you know, for example, we, one of the lawyers in our team um, has been in house her whole career. Um, and actually she's loved it. She's, she, she, she doesn't regret, have any regrets that I'm not being in private practice. She's felt that she's got a really varied, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of set of skills, like from, from that kind of experience, commercial experience. And she just loves the kind of day-to-day -day involvement with the business. So I think for most people, um, the kind of, you know, doing your training in private practice, spending a couple of years there, and then at that point kind of starting to think more seriously about where you see your future is where most people will probably end up. I think you you have a feeling, I would say, by two to three years PQE of where ultimately you think you will end up, whether it's the partnership route at a private practice or whether it's, you know, moving in-house. Um, and I think the other, the, the final thing I'd say is that moving in-house is, I feel that in-house is starting to become more sophisticated in terms of the internal legal functions in in-house. And I feel that in the past, there may have been kind of this view that, oh, right, well, you move to one position and you kind of stay there, you just move sideways, you don't really move upwards for a long period of time. Um, I think the opportunities now in-house are, are, are more varied. Um, I think there is an increasing tendency for people to bring resource in-house, particularly with obviously what's been happening recently in the economic pressures. So I, I feel that the opportunities in-house are greater, certainly greater than they were when I was doing my training contract. Um, and I guess I would say, don't just make the assumption that actually the standard training contract for two years private practice route is what you should do. Um, it's very easy to kind of just assume that because that's the norm, it's what you should do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, don't, you know, make, make sure you really think about what it is that interests you. I mean, obviously you have to have a basic interest in the law, but what interests you? Does it, do, are you more more concerned about working with lots of different companies and kind of really getting that rounded experience and actually, um, you know, just being technically a lawyer and that's kind of like the most important thing to you? Or are you actually more interested in being part of something, being part of a, of a, of a business that's growing and the kind of high, in many ways, faster paced environment of being in house? Um, you know, really kind of interrogate yourself about what it is that you want and what your character is.